everyone. I'm Allison Morris. You're watching NBC News Now. Right now, a state of emergency in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Andrew Brown Jr.'s family demanding the full body cam footage of his death. A sheriff's deputy shot and killed Brown last Wednesday while executing a search warrant. What is it on this video that is so damning that you will risk your career and risk losing your job so the people can't see the video? And Isaiah Brown fighting for his life, shot 10 times by a sheriff's deputy in Virginia. Police say they were responding to a 911 call from Brown who said he was going to kill his brother. My concern at this point is just for my son to hopefully come home alive. And in Washington, President Biden's approval ratings are in. How do Americans think he's doing in his first 100 days? All right, we'll start this hour with those two police shootings. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, covering Andrew Brown Jr.'s death. And NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman is in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where Isaiah Brown is in the hospital hanging on today. Kathy, we will start with you. Andrew Brown's family, I had expected to see that the full body cam footage of his death today, but they only got to see 20 seconds. Why? What is going on there? So, Allison, there was a lot of anticipation to see uh, this body camera footage. It's been several days since the shooting. And 1130, that's when they were all supposed to come together to the sheriff's office uh, to see this footage. Family was allowed uh, to come forward and, and get a closer look at this and get some questions answered. Um, but just a few moments ago, we had uh, an attorney representing the family come out saying that they only saw 20 seconds of this footage and from only one body camera. And they're saying there were several law enforcement um, officials on site when things quickly escalated. So they are uh, quite baffled at the fact that they only got this uh, snippet. And they said um, at one point, um, you know, when when they saw the footage, a deputy had blocked in uh, Mr. Brown in his driveway and the footage. We don't know what happened before or after, but but shots were being fired, according to the attorney, uh, when they saw this footage. Um, and apparently another highlight that they, they pointed out was that uh, his hands were on the steering wheel uh, when when this all kind of transpired. So apparently he was backing away, trying to avoid gunfire from the deputies on the ground. But but that's all they are working mm -hmm. with. And that's why they are growing even more frustrated because they want more transparency and accountability. They want the uh, the arrest of these uh, deputies who were involved in this. And of course, this is ongoing investigation. We don't have their names. Their, their identities have not been released. And we were told that potentially Wednesday, uh, that's when they'll be going to the courts. A lot of people want to see the, the footage, um, including members of the public and, and the media as well, to see exactly what transpired. So sure. um, obviously still a lot of questions and uh, family members, they're, they're very upset. They're grieving. Uh, but this is not enough for them, they said. Absolutely. They want to see more information. They want to see that video, understandably so. Kathy, could you just explain for us? I know there is a state of emergency in Elizabeth City right now. So what does that mean? What's going on uh, in the city as we speak? So I spoke with the, the mayor of Elizabeth City earlier today, just a, ahead of what could uh, potentially happen with the release of the body camera footage. And, and protests have been happening since last Wednesday, uh, since the shooting occurred, and they have all been peaceful. But uh, she wanted to just kind of get ahead of the situation, just kind of pre preemptively put this emergency order in effect in case there is any sort of unrest. And uh, with this declaration in place, it just allows more resources to come into play if they do need to, to move forward uh, with that. But right now, um, we, we saw a large group. They were gathered out here in front of the sheriff's office uh, since seven o'clock this morning in anticipation to, to get more details of the body camera footage. But everything has been uh, relatively peaceful. Obviously, uh, lots of chance for uh, wanting justice for, mm -hmm. for Andrew Brown Jr., though. All right, Kathy Park in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Thank you so much. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joining us now. He is in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where Isaiah Brown is in the hospital today. Uh, hanging on, we understand. Josh, let's just start with that. How is Isaiah Brown doing? We've heard he's in the ICU fighting for his life. What's the latest there? 
The way his family described it today, Allison, was touch and go. And in fact, uh, the initial comments from law enforcement had been that Isaiah Brown had only non-life-threatening injuries. But uh, his family and his attorney saying today that, in fact, he was shot 10 times, underwent multiple surgeries in which two of those bullets were removed from Isaiah, Br Isaiah Brown's body, but eight bullets still remain in him as he is hooked on to a breathing machine trying to recover uh, in the hospital right now. Allison, his family saying in a news conference a little bit ago outside the courthouse uh, that they don't really know what to feel at this point in time, but that their main concern is that he come home alive. Oh, my gosh, that sounds pretty serious indeed. Uh, so, Josh, uh, Isaiah Brown, as you said, shot 10 times by a sheriff's deputy after Brown called 911. Uh, his family's attorney is demanding that all the audio from that 911 call be released. Here he is. This was clearly a failure of communication between the dispatch and the officers that arrived on scene. We are uh, demanding today that all audio be released. So, Josh, what do you know about the shooting at this point? I know there are still some bits that we need filled in here and they want to hear uh, that audio. But what, what do we know uh, at this stage of the game? Well, just this hour, Allison, we learned from state police that there were actually two 911 calls. The first placed by Isaiah Brown at about 2.30 a.m. when he needed help getting home from the gas station where his car had broken down. Uh, and then this second call that took place amid some type of an altercation with his brother. It was listed by the sheriff's office as a domestic disturbance. He can be heard in that 911 call uh, talking about the presence of a gun, threatening to kill his brother, then sort of changing his story and saying he did not, in fact, uh, have a gun with him. And that's when the same deputy who'd given him a ride home uh, arrived, apparently thought that the phone that he had in his hand that he was using to speak with the 911 dispatcher was, in fact, a handgun. Uh, and that deputy shooting Isaiah Brown 10 times, Allison. All right. Josh Letterman reporting for us from Virginia. Thank you so much. It is only April and there have already been seven mass shootings in the U.S. this year. Experts are worried more are on the way, calling this a contagion effect. NBCNews.com reporter Doha Madani explains. Over the last month, we've seen gunmen open fire across the country, from a set of spas in Georgia, a grocery store in Colorado, to a bar in Wisconsin. It almost feels like mass shootings are contagious. And some experts believe it could be. When mental health advocates discuss suicide prevention, they often warn of a contagion effect. When details about one suicide death triggers other people who might be in the midst of an emotional crisis. A similar effect is being seen in mass shootings, where potential shooters who are vulnerable, enraged, and have access to a weapon might find validation in someone else's act of violence. But the contagion effect shouldn't be confused with a copycat killing. Copycats basically are trying to mimic the same crime. Contagion effect is just more general so that when the consequences of a event are something that the person would be reinforced by, mm -hmm. then other people might be more likely to do something similar, but not exactly. A study from 2015 found there's about a two week period following a mass shooting where the contagion effect is at its highest. And a follow-up study in 2017 confirmed those findings, referring the term generalized imitation. So much like in cases of suicide, it's important to be aware of how we discuss shootings, both in the news and on our personal social feeds. Researchers warn against sharing the photo of a gunman and suggest being wary of digging for too many details about their lives. That's to avoid giving them too much notoriety. According to both experts in criminology and psychology, mass shootings are what happens when trauma and despair meet rage. If you generally increase the despair that the community is feeling, then individuals in the community are more likely, not 100%, but more likely to experience despair, more likely to experience rage, more likely to experience fear. And those three emotions do the lion's share of the harm in our world. It's important to remember that an emotional crisis isn't the same thing as mental illness. 
Studies show that the connection between severe mental illness and violence is exaggerated in public perception, and that victimization of those with mental illness is a greater public health concern than perpetration. Alternatively, emotional crises can be the result of different environmental factors. Grief, financial distress, housing insecurity are all situations that can put a strain on one's mental health none of which have been in short supply over the last year and a half. We've had all these risk factors exacerbated over the pandemic, and we've been seeing this increase in homicides and gun violence throughout the pandemic. You know, I've been thinking about this the whole time, sort of what happens when we are no longer locked down. And I think that's what we're seeing is there's this explosion of gun violence. Combine that upheaval with the fact that almost 40 million guns were sold in America in 2020. According to FBI data, that was a 40% increase over the year before. It's what one expert described to me as a perfect storm for a gun trauma super spreader as we begin to lift COVID-19 restrictions around the country. The DOJ now investigating the Louisville Metro Police Department. AG Merrick Garland announcing that civil investigation this afternoon. It will determine whether LMPD engages in unconstitutional stops, searches, and seizures, as well as whether the department unlawfully executes search warrants on private homes. NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams joining me now. Pete, this is a pattern or practice investigation. It's the same type of investigation that's going on in Minneapolis right now. That investigation was announced the day after Derek Chauvin was found guilty of murdering George Floyd. This investigation, more than a year after Breonna Taylor was shot and killed by police in her apartment. How uh, how much of a role will her her death play in, in the DOJ's investigation? And what specifically is the Justice Department looking into here in Louisville? Well, some role, because one of the things the Justice Department will look here uh, at in Louisville is is how the Louisville Police Department does searches of people's homes. Remember, it was a search of her home, a no-knock search purportedly to investigate a drug crime that led to her death by police officers. So that's one thing that they'll look at. But unlike the criminal investigations to see whether there was a violation of the law in that event, the civil rights investigation takes a broader look at the entire Louisville Police Department. So clearly that's a catalytic event here. I don't, I don't think they'd be doing this investigation without it, but it's not the centerpiece of their investigation. It'll be much broader. It'll look at, do they uh, unjustifiably, unconstitutionally, racially profile people that they pull over for stops on the highway or on the roads or, or on the street? Uh, do, they, do they violate civil rights laws? Do they racially discriminate in, when they do that? How are police trained? How are they supervised? How are they held accountable? All of those things will be looked at here. So it's it's a much broader investigation than just one single event. Pete, Louisville's mayor and the police chief have both said that they welcome the Justice Department's investigation. Here is Chief Erica Shields this afternoon. I can't say that I was entirely surprised. Um, by the DOJ's announcement. I think it's I think it's a good thing. I think that it's necessary because police reform, quite honestly, is needed in near every agency across the country. And if us at Louisville LMPD are going to be one of the flagship departments for change, then bring it on. All right. So, Pete, it does look like the DOJ is going to get cooperation here. But what kind of cooperation, what kinds of questions and things uh, will the DOJ typically be asking of the mayor and the police chief in an investigation like this? And and how important is it to have them on on board here? Well, it's really essential because basically what the government now does is say, OK, police department, open your books. We want to see all the data. How many people do you pull over? How many searches do you conduct? What sort of work do you do? How many no-knock searches do you do? Um, what, are your criteria, what are your training criteria for the use of force, including against peaceful protesters? So they need data. They need numbers of how often the police do various things. How often do the police get complaints from the public? How are those complaints handled? That's all a matter of the record, and that's all a matter of looking at police data. So the extent to which the police say, come on in, we're an open book, helps greatly. 
Absolutely. Pete Williams, uh, thank you so much. Appreciate having you on today. You bet. This is a pretty big week for the president, his first joint address of Congress, his 100th day in office, and potentially an announcement tomorrow on new CDC guidance for wearing masks outside. So how is President Biden doing in his first 100 days? Well, in a brand new NBC News poll, 69 percent of voters say they approve of Biden's handling of the pandemic. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli here now. Uh, and, And Mike, let's dive right into that. The majority of Americans approve of the job the president's doing with COVID, according to our newest poll. And look, we know even just anecdotes. Totally right. A lot of Americans want to know when they can start doing more with their lives, uh, when they can stop feeling less restricted. Do you have any idea what this new mask guidance will be tomorrow? Any clues? Yeah, so there are a couple key questions that this White House is grappling with around the issue of masking. Remember when the president was president-elect, he talked about having a 100-day campaign encouraging Americans to mask up. So one of them is, is he going to call for extending that in any form as we move now into the second 100 days? Another has to do with, given the number of vaccinated Americans now, as we've crossed the 50 percent mark, and obviously there's still a ways to go, but what does having a vaccine mean for an obligation to continue? to mask. And then thirdly, especially as we're now into the spring season heading into summer, uh, does an individual need to continue to wear masks outside, outdoors, especially important for those of us who are starting to attend Major League Baseball games uh, again, and and we are encouraged to wear masks at the ballpark. So these are some of the questions we expect the White House to begin answering as soon as tomorrow. Interestingly, the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki indicated that some of the policymaking is still in its final stages, so we don't have final answers yet, but those are certainly the questions that they're grappling with. Mike, I will mask on mask on mask on mask if it means I can go to a baseball game. That is no problem uh, at all. But uh, listen, we're all wondering, right? You go outside and you're just not sure what do I do? When do I wear one? What? We're all just looking for a little guidance. So we will look forward to that tomorrow. Uh, today, President Biden signed an executive order. It sets up a new task force to promote labor organizing. Who's running that task force uh, and what issues will it target? Obviously, jobs are a huge issue as we try to claw our way out of this pandemic recession. Yeah, this is one of those opportunities where I get to channel Joe Biden a little bit because we heard him throughout the campaign say he was going to be a president who wasn't afraid to use, as he put it, the word union. Uh, He is somebody who has styled himself as a friend of labor throughout his career. So no surprise that he's setting up a commission within the White House to study labor in America, the role in America now. He said he wants to bring us back to what the National Labor Relations Act was intended to do, which is not just protect labor uh, workers, union workers, in this country, but to encourage people to unionize still. Remember, he lent his support in a very rare move for a president to those uh, p- uh, vote in Alabama about Amazon potential unionizing obviously did not uh, end up occurring. Mm-hmm. But also interesting, Allison, you mentioned it, is who is running it. He has asked Vice President Kamala Harris uh, to lead up this effort. The labor secretary, as you might imagine, Marty Walsh, is going to be the vice chair of this team. But this is another interesting example for those of us who are studying the relationship between president and vice president of a way in which he's trying to bring Kamala Harris into the fold here, give her a significant policy portfolio for her to sink her teeth into. And so that's part of her new portfolio. In addition to what we know, she's getting a first stab at today in her role at leading up the diplomacy in the Northern Triangle as she has a virtual meeting today with the Guatemalan president. Mike, we're also learning a little bit more about what the president's joint address of Congress will look like this Wednesday. I know there are going to be pandemic protocols in place. What can you tell us there? And can you just hit our audience with the viewing particulars uh, so they know the whens and the wheres? And of course, they'll be watching on NBC. Of course, Wednesday night at 9.01 p.m. is when we expect to see uh, the president introduced to the House chamber, but a very different House chamber, of course, given the COVID protocols. Only 200, and not the full House and Senate, 535 lawmakers, uh, 200 seats in the chamber. Uh, Typically, the First Lady would have some invited guests, as we're typically uh, used to seeing the the president referred to in the galleries of the House chamber. Not so. The, The First Lady and the second gentleman will be in attendance, but they won't have the kind of guests that we typically see, in part because some of the members of the House and Senate are themselves going to be sitting uh, in those galleries uh, in order to have social distancing. The president will not be wearing a mask in the House chamber, but when we see that historic picture behind him of two women as the vice president, uh, of course, Kamala Harris, and the speaker, the first time we're going to see two women seated behind the president when he delivers a State of the Union address, uh, they may be still wearing a mask. But as to the particulars of the speech, the president uh, is known to be somebody who 
was working on this up until the last minute. He was home in Delaware this weekend. His chief speechwriter, Vinay Reddy, uh, and his message guru, Mike Donilon, are the architects of this speech, but they're still uh, putting some of the final touches on this. I expect they're going to be doing so right up until 9.01 p.m. on Wednesday night. Yeah, uh, right up until nine o'clock, they'll be making sure it's perfect. Listen, Mike, I know the focus is on what the president is saying, but I'm going to definitely take a moment, as I think a lot of women in America are, to stop and look at that and realize there are two women up there. Uh, we're making some progress. That's good stuff. Thanks so much, Mike. You got it. What happened on January 6th when House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy called President Trump in the middle of the Capitol riots? McCarthy is now skirting some questions about that phone call, saying then-President Trump didn't know about the riots when McCarthy first reached him. NBC News political reporter Alan Smith has quite a few stories on the GOP on NBCNews.com right now. Uh, so, Alan, we're going to go through all of these. Let's start with McCarthy changing his tune. That is not what he originally said about his call with Trump. Uh, what's he saying this week? Well, I mean, he's sort of dancing around questions about what was said on that phone call. I mean, if you listen to his answer uh, in an interview with Chris Wallace yesterday, you know, he's basically saying a phone call happened, the riot was going on, and I told the president to put up a video, and then he did, and then that was that that, that was very good from him. And I think Chris Wallace pushed back and saying, "Hey, you know, like that video came out hours later, and it really wasn't that strong. I mean, this is a video we're talking about where the president was saying, you know, we love you, you guys are great, but please go home." Um, and and McCarthy, you know. He's basically had a long time to sort of respond to this uh, account of the call that's been made public by Jaime Herrera uh, Boitler, who is uh, one of the Republicans who uh, voted to impeach Trump. And, uh, you know, her, her account was pretty damning. It was a huge part of the impeachment trial. And we never really heard much from McCarthy mm -hmm. then about that call. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to hear two months later, uh, he's, he's really giving a, a sort of bare bones assessment of what happened on there. And really, it's in line with uh, you know, him not wanting to distance himself from Trump too much. We, we saw him weeks after the riot go down and visit Trump at Mar-a-Lago. He's clearly, you know, calculated that keeping Trump in the fold is very important for Republicans heading into the midterms. Um, but, you know, the result of that is we're seeing this evolution from McCarthy saying, look, Trump, uh, you know, he shoulders some blame for what happened on January 6th uh, to him not really wanting to talk about that too much. But you're also reporting on Republican Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, who recently said this uh, about the COVID vaccine. What is the point? If the, the, of course, the science tells us that vaccines are 95 percent effective. So if you have a vaccine, quite honestly, what do you care if your neighbor has one or not? That is not exactly the vice advice we've been getting from medical experts, Alan. Uh, I know his colleague, Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito, is not too happy with that messaging. What's she saying? Well, she said in an interview on a CNN State of the Union yesterday that comments like that from Senator Johnson really hurt the overall effort to get as many people vaccinated as possible. And of course, keep in mind, this is with the backdrop that there's there's a solid maybe 30 to 35 percent of conservatives and Trump voters who are saying right now they don't want to be getting the vaccine at all. They're just hard nose on it. And there's another significant uh, number of conservatives and Trump voters who are saying that they're still on the fence about it. So, I mean, comments like that from Senator Johnson, they're, they're not really working to help encourage more people to get the vaccine. And really, with Republicans and Democrats, you're, you're kind of seeing a broad consensus uh, toward getting people to, to take the vaccine and trust its safety. Um, but with Senator Johnson, you know, it's, uh, it's not even just the vaccine issue. I mean, he's kind of been at the forefront of uh, some other conspiracies, whether it be, you know, anti-vax stuff or also, yeah. you know, as it relates to the January 6th riot, right? He was the one you know, using this frame of I'm just asking questions, talking about, you know, was there Antifa at the front of the line uh, during the riot? So this isn't really that new from Senator Johnson, um, but you're going to see Republican pushback on this because most Republicans are really on board with getting as many people vaccinated as possible. And you've even heard from former President Trump, you know, get the vaccine. Alan Smith with nearly as many stories on the GOP this week as he has Pittsburgh sports bobbleheads behind him. I'm super into that, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you. I only wish I had more. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She has the latest headlines for us from NBCNews.com. A very happy Monday to you, Simone.
Hey, Allison, starting with the European Union and some news that could impact your vacation plan. So fully vaccinated Americans might be able to travel to the EU this summer. The head of the bloc's executive body didn't establish a timeline for travel to restart, but did say they'd be requiring digital vaccination certificates. And Apple announcing plans today to build its first East Coast campus in North Carolina's Raleigh-Durham area. The tech titan will invest $1 billion in the state and the campus, and it's expected to create at least 3,000 and new jobs in the Tar Heel state. Big picture here, Apple is looking to ramp up investment now that the U.S. economy is recovering from the pandemic. And growing anger over in India after the government ordered Twitter to take down posts criticizing its handling of COVID-19. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is facing accusations that he's downplaying the government's response. Twitter confirmed to NBC News it partially complied and withheld content, but only in India. And the Prime Minister of Thailand slapped with a fine for not wearing his mask in public. Authorities are fining people up to $640 for not wearing a mask, and clearly no one is exempt from the rule there. It's an attempt to control the latest COVID outbreak in that country. And Chloe Zhao making history after becoming the first woman of color to win the Oscar for Best Director. But her home country of China isn't celebrating. Chinese state media hasn't mentioned her win and online. Any mentions on blogs, websites or social media seem to be censored. Zhao has faced a nationalist backlash for allegedly insulting her country with comments on the political system. Really a missed opportunity there, Allison, not to celebrate this huge achievement. And Simone, I can't help smiling looking at those pictures. I screamed last night. I was so excited for her and Frances McDormand. Uh, Nomadland was such a good movie. I absolutely loved it. Uh, So great to see their wins. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Simone. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine now available in Los Angeles County. Patients who get the shot will also get a pamphlet with details on the potential risks. The nearly two-week pause on the J&J shot is making some L.A. residents still a little bit nervous. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin is outside a community health center in South Los Angeles. Uh, So, Aaron, tell us, now that the J&J shot is back in circulation, what's the plan to get it into arms there? And what are the folks who live there saying about it? Hey, Allison, we're here at this health center in South Los Angeles. Officials are working overtime to get as many shots into arms as possible, whether that be Moderna, Pfizer or Johnson and Johnson. Let me just set the scene here behind me. You can see here they're setting up vaccine tents over there. That's where uh, you get the actual vaccination. This is what they call the pit where people sit and wait to see if they have any side effects following the shot. And this is really critically important, especially when you consider how the pandemic has hit Uh, the southern part of Los Angeles and hit it hard. At one point, officials here estimated that 25 percent of the population had COVID-19. It's a densely populated area. Many migrant workers here uh, as well. And over here, let me just show you here. This is where they're preparing the syringes. Uh, You can see they've got some Pfizer set up here. Um, J&J was on a tray here not long ago. And everyone who gets a shot uh, will also get some sort of literature to educate them about the situation. Here's the J&J and J pamphlet with the updated information about the risks of clotting. And officials say this is essential, even though those risks of clotting are rare, it is essential to educate people so that they know what to look for. Doctors also know what to look for in case that rare side effect does take place. I was speaking just a short while ago to the director here who told me why J and J is so important to this community. We had other patients who were traveling outside of the country who were adamant they really wanted uh, J&J. Those who live here but may work in Mexico City, for example, they came and got the J&J this weekend. There are people in our community that prefer J&J because they only wanted to be poked once and they wanted the maximum protection they can get and they felt for them the right choice was J&J. We were so excited when we got word on Friday that we can unlock our fridge and use it and we're very proud that we were able to use several doses of J&J from Friday onward and we're going to do a lot of that today. As you can see, the people here behind me, believe it or not, this is a slow day here, according to officials. They normally vaccinate around 3,000 people a day at this facility. It's down to 2,000, they estimate, for today, Allison. 
Aaron, I love Dr. Abraham's enthusiasm there. Uh, definitely the person that you want to be guiding you through this process when you're going to get your shot. I have to ask you a question, though. Uh, we're hearing from the CDC that about 5 million people in the U.S. have missed their second Moderna or Pfizer shots. Uh, as people know, you know, J&J, you get one. Pfizer and Moderna, you get two. What are doctors there telling you? How big of a problem is it if people don't come back for round two? Well, you know, it's a huge concern for this health center. As you were just hearing uh, Dr. Abraham say, they're, they're, they're very worried about people returning for their second shot. That's why the J&J is seen uh, as an important solution for those people who may not, not, may not be able to return for the shot. And he also told me that he, he worries that it impacts vaccine hesitancy as well. And they have a goal here to reach herd immunity by the end of May. They say that that setback could put that goal in jeopardy. Take a listen. I think it did set us back. We were expecting to achieve herd immunity in our community probably around the end of May. That may be pushed further into the future as now people who were already a little hesitant or resistant may now say, hold on, let me just wait a few more weeks or days. And we just don't have that kind of time. And they have seen a slowdown in demand here for the vaccines. That's why uh, Dr. Abraham, as well as other health workers, are really working overtime to get out into the community, to get those shots into arms. They're going to parks. They're going to places where people live to really combat that vaccine hesitancy. Also making this facility available for longer. For example, it used to close at four. Now it's closing at midnight so that those people coming off work can come here and get their vaccines. Allison. All right, Aaron McLaughlin in Los Angeles. Thank you so much. A digital health pass could be your ticket to sporting events, concerts, and theaters, but how do they work? NBC News Now anchor Aaron Gilchrist, Gilchrist tried out New York's version at Yankee Stadium. Look closely. Yep, there are fans here in the stands at New York's famed Yankee Stadium. Baseball lovers are slowly making their return to the ballpark. But before you can get into a ball game or many other large events in New York, you have to prove that you're COVID free. In New York, one way you can do that is with an Excelsior Pass. And that starts by getting registered online. I went to the Excelsior Pass website and entered some basic information that the state already knows about me. Name, birth date, zip code. You'll also have to answer three challenge questions whose answers are unique to you. In my case, they were about my last COVID-19 test. While people have been calling it a vaccine passport, it's really a health pass, confirmation that you've recently tested negative or been vaccinated for the coronavirus. In less than a minute, I had my health pass showing a negative PCR test. That's acceptable until until midnight on the third day after my test. The rapid antigen test pass is good for six hours after your test, although my producer found that his info from a test he took around 3 p.m. didn't upload to the state fast enough to generate a pass before the 6.30 game. He still was able to use the test provider's results to get in. If you're vaccinated, Excelsior will generate a pass that's good for 180 days. Then you'll have to retrieve a new one. Now that I know my pass is ready, no paper to keep track of, and we're off to the ballpark. Now, I waited until I arrived at the stadium to download the Excelsior app to my iPhone. You should definitely do that before you get here. But after a few taps, the app is loaded and my digital pass is in my palm. We made it to Yankee Stadium. I've got my health pass ready to go. Let's get in line. Face covered, social distance. I waited my turn in line. Now, some venues scan the QR code on your phone. Others will verify your pass is valid by the date. They all are supposed to ask to see your ID to match your name and face to the pass. A quick temperature check, and I'm through the entry gate and on my way to my seat. And just like that, we're in. Time to go enjoy some baseball. Now, this pass is only being used in New York right now, and it's not required. These venues will accept other forms of proof of status. The state says the Excelsior Pass doesn't collect or store your personal information. And when your COVID test pass expires, you have to start from scratch to get a new one. 
It is time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's happening in the business world and beyond. We've got big tech earnings, the Fed and the American Families Plan all on deck this week. So let's bring in CNBC correspondent Rahel Solomon. Uh, Rahel, a third of the companies in the S&P 500 reporting uh, results this week. Tesla kicking things off this afternoon as uh, CEO Elon Musk is getting ready to host Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live in a couple of weeks. Uh, so what have you got on Tesla for us and who else is reporting this week? Hey, Allison. Yeah, so Tesla numbers actually just crossed about 30 minutes ago. Uh, the company performed better in terms of revenue and earnings than Wall Street analysts were expecting. The conference called for investors and analysts. That begins at 530 Eastern, so we'll get a lot more details then. But then tomorrow we hear from two big heavy hitters, Microsoft and Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Wednesday, there's Facebook, Apple and Boeing, among others. But those are some of the big ones. Oh, my God. Look at that. Thursday. Yes. We'll hear from Amazon and McDonald's. It's very busy around here at CNBC this week. And then Friday, some of the big oil (laughs) names like Chevron and ExxonMobil. And Allison, just for some context here, so far, about a quarter of the S&P has reported. And more than 84 percent of the results have been better than estimates. So depending on how you look at it, earnings are either very strong this quarter or analyst expectations were just far too low. We've heard quite a bit of that as well. Depends on how you look at it. Yeah, it's a very fair point to make, but nice to hear that they are uh, not disappointing. Always happy to hear uh, better than expected earnings. Uh, Let me ask you about the Federal Reserve. They're meeting Tuesday and Wednesday. Normally, we would be watching for a rate change, uh, but the Fed has made it pretty clear they are keeping rates near zero while we work our way out of this pandemic. So no real major interest rate talk this week, but I know inflation is a biggie. Uh, What are you watching for there and why should our viewers care? I I know when the Fed releases uh, its reports or or talks to the public, they sometimes use big words that don't don't mean a lot to the average person. So why is this two day meeting important for the average American? Yeah. And sometimes it's full of jargon. So it's important because the group works to control inflation. So, (laughs) yeah, you know, keep prices in check when you go to the grocery store, not too high. They also watch the employment picture very closely. So while the labor market, of course, has been showing signs of improvement, the Fed has acknowledged it's not where it needs to be. That's part of the reason they're keeping rates so low, as you said, Allison. And low rates matter because they allow for cheaper borrowing, which can make things like mortgages. We know that they've been at historic lows and auto loans more affordable for ordinary Americans. So that's why it really matters. It sort of keep the wheels of the economy mm-hmm. grease, certainly in times like this. But as you said, Allison, we know they're not changing the rates. But what people are very focused on is their strategy around inflation. Fed Chair Powell has said that they're going to let inflation go above their normal target, but that the rise in prices will be short term. That said, inflation concerns have already been felt in the markets as of late. As of late, some investors are not really happy with what they're seeing, you know. Yeah. Rahel, thank you so much for explaining that in terms that people can understand. I'm a Fed junkie and I'm a big fan of hearing what uh, Jay Powell has to say. But sometimes it could be a little uh, complicated for people to understand what matters to them in all of that. Uh, so Agreed. thank you for making it making it uh, digestible. Uh, also this week, uh, we're looking for more details from President Biden on his American families plan. Everybody wants to know if their taxes are going to go up. Uh, so what are some of the financial concerns here? Well, uh, your taxes may go up depending on how much you make. If you are a very high earner, there is a chance. So, yes, we're going to hear from President Joe Biden on Wednesday. He's going to address a joint session of Congress. He is expected to unveil the details of his American families plan and the tax increases to pay for that, including a much higher capital gains tax for the wealthy. That has been making quite the the fuss in the investment community. It also briefly shocked the markets, which led to quite a sell off last week when that news broke. So, Allison, the expectation is that he will propose a capital gains tax rate of 39.6 percent for people earning. And here's the thing, more than a million dollars a year. But that alone does nearly double the long term capital gains rate of 20 percent for the richest Americans. We should say the White House, by the way, pushing back today against some of the criticism, saying that, among other things, the increase would only impact 0.3 percent of taxpayers. So the answer is, yes, your taxes may go up, but only if you make a million dollars a year, at least according to the White House. I was just going to say, you know, bad news, your taxes might go up. But if your taxes are going up, you're rich. So great for you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm a little priced out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't think I'm going to be in that bracket either. But hey, something to strive for, right? Uh, yeah. Rahel, you also have great news. Uh, after more than a year, Disneyland in California is reopening this week. Details, please. Yeah, so it's such a big deal for Disney. The parks experiences and consumer product segment, well, that accounted for 37 percent of the company's total revenue in 2019. So it's certainly a really big deal for Disney, but it's also a big deal for people who love theme parks. 
Theme parks in California have been closed for a year due to COVID. And while the state is allowing parks to reopen with up to 35 percent capacity, Allison Disney has said that it's actually going to start with just 15 percent capacity to start with. And then here's the pretty big caveat to the reopening. Until further notice, it's only open to California residents. So uh, opening in a, in a very sort of staggered and measured way, at least until things improve in the state of yeah. California. Allison. Well, it's great to hear they're being really, really careful. And listen, I'm an East Coast girl, so I was always a Disney World uh, person. But this is a battle in our house. My husband's from Cali. And so we just fight over this one all the time. Yeah, I mean, in the meantime, just go to Florida. But it is nice to see that they're they're opening in a a measured way in California. (laughs) Yep, hopefully we'll be able to hit Disney soon enough. For how always awesome to have you on on Mondays. We'll hopefully see you next week. Thanks for including us, Allison. See you next week. College is expensive, and there is no guarantee a diploma will land you a high-paying job. So is a degree really necessary? A growing number of companies and CEOs, from the big banks to big tech, are saying no. From J.P. Morgan Chase to Salesforce, NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule shows us what success looks like without a college diploma. 30-year-old Ali Alcala has it all. An apartment in New York City, a thriving career in HR at J.P. Morgan Chase, and more than $70,000 a year in income. What she doesn't have is a college degree. Did you assume that investment banks were only for college grads, even Ivy League school grads? I had no notion that you would be able to even get a foot in the door without a degree. The Global Bank is actively recruiting people without college degrees through programs that pay them to train in careers like operations and consumer banking. I didn't have a degree. My future was extremely uncertain. And the program kind of provided a way, a clear way, where I would be able to pursue a career path or journey. I only went to college because my parents made me go to college. Mark Benioff is the founder and CEO of Salesforce. Everybody thinks that if you don't have a college degree, you can't be successful in the United States, and it's not true. The average cost of a four-year degree has risen to more than $10,000 a year for a public university and 37000 for private, and more than half graduate with an average of $29,000 in student debt. Then is college even worth it? It's expensive. And you can create incredible value for the world without a college degree. I came to this country with a lot of aspirations. After immigrating from Colombia, Juan Medina worked several jobs, including construction and car sales. College was out of the question. If I went part-time, it was going to take me like eight years to, to finish college and possibly some death. A much better alternative for Juan and his growing family? Free online training with Salesforce that led not only to a job. Now I feel like I have a career. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there. More major corporations are abandoning the requirement of a four-year degree. At Apple, half of their employees don't have college degrees. But this path is untested. Many jobs still require a bachelor's degree. And on average, a college graduate makes 67% more than a high school graduate. But as the cost of college rises, some say the returns aren't keeping pace. The idea that to make a lot of money, you need to go to college, that's that's a thing of the past. To make a lot of money, you just need to get the skills. You don't need to go to college. You can do it all online. Ali Alcala sees only one reason why she'd pursue a diploma now. Just to have it framed. Steph Rule joins me now. Steph, this is such a great story, especially as someone who grew up having it drilled in their head that, like, you had to have a college degree to get a job at a bank, to get one of these positions. You're talking about Apple uh, abandoning the college degree requirement, J.P. Morgan there uh, creating its own training program. Do you think this is the trend and that more big companies are going to do the same, or is it too early to say that you can ditch those college applications? No, we are definitely seeing a shift. Remember, even before the pandemic, we had a skills gap in this country and the labor force, it was a really tight labor market. And at the same time, we've got all sorts of Americans who can't make a living wage. So this idea has really been led by the business sector, create these online free training programs to actually recruit more people, broaden out the base, hopefully a more diverse base in terms of race and age. Think about all the people who have left the workforce saying, well, I don't have a background in tech. How can I get one of these new jobs of the future? Well, businesses are taking notice and they're creating these programs. Just think about it. It costs tens of thousands of dollars to go to college. College isn't for everyone. And unlike how you and I were raised, it doesn't mean there's only one path to success. 
Today, there are a lot. Totally. Wonderful to hear that there are lots of different options. Very interested in seeing uh, where this trend goes. Steph, uh, great to have you on. Really appreciate it. Always good to see you. If you're planning a summer getaway and you need a rental car, you better get a move on it. Travelers across the country are having trouble renting cars already with COVID restrictions lifting and more people hitting the roads. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more on what's driving the shortages. Hey there, Allison. That's right. It could be tough to find a car. And then when you find a car, it could be more expensive than you're used to. These rental car companies have experienced whiplash in the last year. They saw their business decimated by the pandemic. And now they're seeing a sudden surge in demand. And it's happening much faster than they anticipated. Rental car companies are facing shortages nationwide, just as many people are gearing up for summer travel. Americans are increasingly looking to travel to beaches, national parks, and much more remote locations this summer, locations where an Uber or a Lyft may not always be available. The shortage fueled in part by decisions made last year when business plummeted at the start of the pandemic. Many cash-strapped rental companies sold off much of their inventories and paused new purchases. Now demand is returning turning at the same time automakers are struggling to produce new vehicles due to supply chain issues. It takes time for these car rental companies to uh, build their supply of cars, given the challenges the automotive industry is under right now. The most expensive rental car cities in the country right now, Bozeman, Montana, Charleston, South Carolina, and Kahului, Hawaii, all seeing huge price jumps compared to 2019. The shortage and price increases even leading some tourists visiting Hawaii to turn to renting U-Hauls instead. Sometimes the only option you have left is going to be a box truck. Well, they don't have any box trucks today because I wanted to rent one. <laughs> So I guess they're all out with tourists. The points guy, Brian Kelly, says if a rental car is key to your trip, first plan around that. Consumers must change their mentality around rental cars. You know, for so long, they've been an afterthought. But now they can be more than the cost of your flight per day rental. Other tips to get you behind the wheel, join the rental company's loyalty program. Check off airport facilities and consider booking directly with the company versus through an online travel agency. The car rental apocalypse, as we're calling it, uh, shows no signs of abating, especially as we get into summer travel. And book in advance and be as savvy as possible. If you can't find a rental car, there are some other options, including this new app that allows you to rent somebody else's car. So imagine a kind of Airbnb, but for cars. Tiny plastics are causing some big environmental concerns. From tires to toothbrushes, microplastics are in practically everything, and they are littering our oceans and even lining our stomachs. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders shows us what's hiding out before our very eyes. Sunrise over the Gulf of Mexico. We're going to head around the point here up into Boca Ciega Bay. We're with researchers from Florida's Eckerd College. Just want to make sure that we're not tangled in any way. Casting nets, not for fish, but to study something we can't easily see, microplastics. What we can easily say is, yes, there's microplastics basically everywhere in Tampa Bay. Microplastics the size of a pencil's eraser or smaller. Well, there's some plastic right there. You can look out here and you don't see plastic, but yet it's all around us. It's no surprise plastics litter the oceans, but it's how microplastics enter the environment that may surprise you. That fleece washes away microplastics with every load. A tire's wear and tear deposits rubber, but also tiny bits of plastics onto the road that eventually drain into waterways. Even your toothpaste includes them. 43.779. Researchers here found Tampa Bay is littered with 4 billion particles. There's probably a particle per Liter. One That's particle, one particle piece of liter. microplastic yes. per that bottle of soda that I have at home. Per that container right there. Is Which that is, a lot? Yes, that is a lot. It's a lot higher in concentration than we find offshore. It's not until the samples are brought to shore, mixed with reactive agents to luminesce, that the microplastics under a black light glow like stars in the Milky Way. All those little particles are? Microplastics that we collected today. Wow. And I could not see it out there. Nope. 
Wastewater treatment plants are often the last line of defense. What is all this? So this, unfortunately, is all the unflushable items that people put down their toilets and their drains. And if you didn't capture it here, this might become the microplastics out in the Gulf of Mexico? Definitely. If there's larger pieces of plastic in there, they could be broken down into smaller pieces, and then that will become the microplastics. Just to do our interview, I had to put on a safety vest that was, yes, wrapped in plastic. Plastics are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. I mean, we're wearing plastic hats, right? I so had to take this out of a plastic it's bag. It's a huge problem, right? So again, this all kind of goes back to the root. Like the root of the problem here is the plastics, all the plastics that are surrounding us. But how do we face that? We start with educating the public about these things. How does a consumer say, I'm going to make a difference because we think we're recycling, we're putting our plastics where they should go, and yet the microplastics are still winding up in the Gulf of Mexico and our world's oceans. So one of the things that we can do is we can start having this conversation with people. First first and foremost, people need to know where all their water goes, right? I think if a lot of people knew that washing their hands, flushing their toilets, all that water and all that plastic contained in it comes to a facility like this and how that then becomes our problem to have to try and, and fix all that, to clean that water, right? Plastics have been somewhat demonized, but when you go to the store, you can't avoid it. It's hard to avoid plastics. Even for you, and you know what you're oh, doing. I'm not going to lie, but you know what? I try to do little things, like I use reusable shopping bags, so that takes the plastic bags out of the equation. Now, I can't avoid having plastic in my tires, so if we're going to use them, let's try to use them in a way that's responsible. So we can try and eliminate some of the plastics in our lives. Realistically, will we get it all in our lifetime? I wish I could say we would, but we can start by educating. But some people would just throw their hands up and say, this this is not on me. I can't change it. I know how frustrating that is. Um, as an educator, I hear that argument all the time. People say, I can't change the world. And I say, yes, you can, because one person starts to make the change, other people will follow suit. And what's in the water is also in sea life. How bad's the problem? One study suggests we are eating the weight of a credit card in plastic every week. If the plastic is in the ocean, is it making its way into the fish? We know for sure that microplastics um, are being mistaken for food by the, the smallest organisms um, in the ocean, like krill uh, or plankton even, and then that gets eaten by the next level up in the food chain, and so it will end up on our dinner plate. Is that plastic gonna cause me a health problem? We don't know. We don't know. We're still trying to figure that out. Microplastics, the smallest big problem that's hidden from view. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.